now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals, presents Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you husky! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Brought to you by Quaker Oats. Old sourdough Jim McAllister was a very sick man, and he knew it. He had worked many streams during his three years in the Yukon and had panned enough gold to send back to his wife and daughter in the States so that they had not been in want. But now, on the threshold of his first great strike, the feeling of doom was upon him. He had hit pay dirt, a seemingly endless vein of gold that promised fortune untold. But his sickness made all that seem dim. McAllister entered the canvas tent where he kept all his belongings. With paper and pencil, he sat down and began to write and draw laboriously. <coughs> Jim McAllister almost collapsed as a new outburst of coughing convulsed him. When he'd recovered, the desire to get away from his diggings and to reach the town of Dawson became paramount in his mind. He placed the unfinished letter in an envelope and placed it unsealed in a large wallet which he carried in the pocket of his parka. Hours later, miles from his starting point, and now on the main trail to Dawson, Jim McAllister collapsed. Clay Barnum and Joe Carter, after a summer and autumn of ill fortune in the gold fields, were heading south to Dawson when they saw through the driving snow a blur of off color against the whiteness. Ho, ho, ho there! Ho, ho. They stopped their sled a short distance from the spot where Jim McAllister lay sprawled in the snow beside his wailing dogs. Clay Barnum bent over the old man. He felt his head, his pulse, and placed his hand inside the man's parka over his heart. Then Barnum stood erect. Hey, it's Jim McAllister. He's dead. Stabbed or shot? Huh? Oh, I don't think so. Well, I see. Now there's no signs of either. And what made you think of that? On account of the word that's been around lately. McAllister struck it rich someplace. If he did, nobody knows where. He never filed a claim any new diggings. You thought maybe somebody killed him and took his... Hey, Joe. He seemed to be headed for Dawson. Maybe he had gold with him. Uh, what are you waiting for? Don't stand there. Let's go through his sled and close and see. All right. Barnum, going through McAllister's pockets, came upon the sourdough's wallet at the same moment that Carter found a bag of gold dust and nuggets in the sled. Carter jumped to his feet triumphantly. Hey, Clay, look. A poke full of gold, a lot of it. Hey, what do you got there? Yeah, it's only a wallet. I see what's in it. I'm going to. Hey, there's an envelope with a letter in it. It's to, uh, let me see, to Mrs. James McAllister. Oh, his wife, huh? I wonder what he wrote to her about. Or maybe... You... Hey, what's the matter? What are you whistling like that for? Hey, look, in a wallet. A picture of that girl. Hey, she's a Lulu, isn't she? Yeah. Hey, look close at that. Hey, doggone, Clay, you know what? This must be McAllister's daughter. Well, sure it is. Can't you see? It's signed Marion. And it says to Daddy with all my love. Intent on the picture in the wallet, both men neglected to hear the approaching sled and dog team until it loomed out of the storm and came to a stop. Look here. Hey, what? Clay, it's money. Quick. Let me see that bag of gold stick in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Easy, King. Easy, boy. Oh, hello. Oh, it's you, Sergeant Preston. Hello, Bonham. Carter. What have we here? Uh, Jim McAllister, Sergeant. We, we just came upon him. He's dead. Yeah. McAllister dead? Oh, yes. No doubt about it. Poor fellow. Yeah, he was a nice old guy. He didn't like people. That much. wallet in your hand and that letter. Are they yours, Barnum? Uh, uh, the wallet? 
Who, these? No, no, they're... they're uh, well, they were McAllister's. We were just looking through his stuff, just wondering if... <laughs> well, you know. Yes, certainly, I know. Let me have them, please. Uh, uh, the wallet? And the letter. The letter belonged to McAllister, too? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's to his wife. It wasn't sealed, so we were going to see if it. If the letter was addressed to his wife, it wasn't meant for us to read. So I'll seal it now and send it to her when I arrive in Dawson. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Right now, I want to ask you mothers and dads a question. Do you know why millions of folks over 35 years of age return to the breakfast of their youth? Well, Quaker Oats supplies more life-sustaining protein to help keep you energetic and alert than any other of 14 leading cereals. Yes, a leading state university made this amazing test on 14 nationally known cereals, both hot and cold, of all shapes and kinds. And in the report published in Food Research, a nationally known scientific journal, Quaker Oats is first in life-giving protein. And remember, for all its energy and stamina value, a breakfast of Quaker Oats, milk, and sugar is only 218 calories. So mothers and dads, for youthful vitality over 35, for that happy, chipper feeling that goes with good nutrition, start eating creamy, delicious, hot Quaker oats every morning. It costs less than a penny a serving and cooks in only two and a half minutes. Tomorrow, get a package of Quaker oats or mother's oats, which are the same. Now to continue. Assisted by Barnum and Carter, Sergeant Preston brought the body of Jim McAllister into the town of Dawson, also his dogs and sled. After a session of questions for official records, the two men who found the body were permitted to go, death having been certified as being due to natural causes. Away from the Mounty headquarters, Carter chuckled. Hey, Clay, Preston and the other Mounty didn't even ask about the poke we took from McAllister. They didn't even suspect we hooked it. Hey, keep your voice down. Huh? The reason they didn't suspect was because we had a few more bags of dust on the sled. You didn't see those. But so what? If I did, we probably wouldn't have got away with stealing them. They'd expect to find gold on McAllister. They know we didn't make a strike. You ought to be glad we have this. You know, Clay, I uh, wish I'd have slipped that girl's picture out of McAllister's wallet. Why? Oh, she was nice. i not forget what she looked like, believe me. Hey, here's a cafe. Let's go in, huh? At Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters, Sergeant Preston wrote a letter. When he'd finished it, he wrapped it around the letter McAllister had written to his wife and placed both in a large official envelope. Then he sealed the envelope, rose from his chair, and walked to where Constable Harris had arranged the dead man's effects. There you are, Harris. This explains everything to Mrs. McAllister. Send it along with his things, will you please? Sure thing, Sergeant. Back in the United States... When they received Jim McAllister's personal belongings, together with a notification of his death, his wife and his lovely daughter, 20-year-old Marion, were heartbroken. But after a week, when there seemed to be no more tears that could be shed, the mother and daughter read Jim's last letter once more. Oh, it must have been terrible, the life he was forced to lead up there. Just think of it, Marion. He says that out of all the people he'd met, there wasn't one he'd trust. Except whoever it was he wanted to get in touch with, and... In case he died. Yes. But chances are we'll never know who that was. Mother, it could be that Sergeant Preston. That was such a sweet, sympathetic letter he wrote. He said he knew Dad well and that he admired him. But he didn't say that he knew where your father's mind was. One he writes about in this letter. No one knew except Dad. And now us. Yeah, we still don't know. All we have is this map Jim drew. I can't make head or tail of it. Well, there are some places that seem plain enough to me on that map. Oh? There's Dawson. Here's Forty Mile. And these are the mountains. And in here, some place is the mine. Yes, some place. Are you able to make it all? No, but perhaps Sergeant Preston will help me. Sergeant Preston? You mean the man who wrote to us from Dawson? Yes. I'm going to Dawson City, Mother. Now, just a moment, Marion. If you do go, remember what your father says here about not telling a single soul where the mine is located. And that means anyone. No, Mother, I'll never tell anyone what's on this map. I'll memorize it and keep it in my mind all the time. And when I get to Dawson City, I'll go see Sergeant Preston at once. Marion McAllister arrived in Skagway about a month later, 
then went by barge and dog sled to Dawson City, now teeming with men back from the gold fields for the winter. She went at once to a hotel, registered, and then, after changing clothes, set out for Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters. She did not see Clay Barnum and Joe Carter in front of the cafe, concentrating on her. Clay, am I seeing things, or is that a ghost? A ghost? Joe, that's an angel. And I never forget the face of an angel. Ah, no, me neither. Clay, that's a girl, all right, the one in the picture. Yeah, Marion McAllister. Joe. Yeah? You have any ideas what it means for being in Dawson City like this? Sure, it means she's here after the mine her old man found. Found, but didn't register. We checked again on that last week. Wherever it was, he staked out his claim. He never put down a record. You think maybe she knows? It was that letter to his wife, you remember? Yes, I remember. Hey, Joe, look, she's heading for Monty headquarters. Yeah, and Preston's there, too. He and Harris have those two fellows that did the murder in that 40 mile. Yeah, take them down to Whitehorse. Joe, come on. Hey, where are you going? Over to Monty headquarters where the girl's just going in. We'll go in and say we want to get warm. See if we can't learn something worthwhile. In the rear room of headquarters, Sergeant Preston tested the handcuffs of the two murderers he had captured and was now taking to Fort Selkirk for transfer to other officers. He was about to take them from the cell when Constable Harris entered from the outer office. Sergeant, hold up a bit, eh? What's wrong, Constable? Nothing, Sergeant. There's a young lady out front who insists on seeing you. She came all the way from the States for the privilege. Oh? Who is she? Marion McAllister. Old Jim, the daughter. Take over a while, eh? I'll not be long. All right, Sergeant. When Sergeant Preston entered the outer office, the beautiful Marion McAllister looked up and introduced herself. Oh, hello. You must be Sergeant Preston. I'm Marion McAllister. How do you do? The constable said King is your dog. Oh, he's wonderful. You're my friend, aren't you, King? He seldom makes friends so easily. It's the only introduction you need. I'm flattered. Constable Harris tells me you came all the way from the States to talk with me. That's right. It's about the letter you forwarded to Mother... After my father died... The girl glanced at the two men who stood in the corner, warming their hands over the stove. I'd like to be sure no one overhears us while I tell you about it. Well, uh, come into the next room. I don't think we'll be interrupted. All right. The two men at the stove watched from the corner of their eyes as Preston and the girl entered the next room. The sergeant pushed the door closed behind him, but not tightly. King, following his master and the friendly girl, pushed the door open wide oh. enough to enter. The door remained ajar. Clay Barnum and Joe Carter exchanged glances, then inched closer to the door so that they could hear Preston and Marion McAllister inside. Preston, studying a piece of paper the girl had given him, was talking. This map's clear enough up to a point. I'd say the mine was a few miles this side of 40 Mile, probably near Rocky Creek. No wonder none of the prospectors have been able to locate the place. That area is supposed to be panned out. No one's mined there all summer. I'd like to try and locate that mine, Sergeant. I'm sure it'll be easy with this map. Not as easy as you think, Miss McAllister. First of all, you'll not be allowed to go into the gold fields. What? The order holds for all women. As a matter of fact, we're discouraging men from going, too. Those who've been here a few years wouldn't think of taking to the trail in the weather we're having. You're going to turn down my request for permission to look for my father's mind so I might register it? Definitely. Perhaps there is a law that would keep me from seeking my father's mind, but there's justice, too. Which we of the Northwest Mounted Police try to ensure. If that's the case, then why not help me? I didn't say I wouldn't help you, if I can. I was merely discouraging any plan you might have that involved your leaving Dawson and heading north. Oh, then then you will do something? I'll try, but only after I return from Selkirk. I'm delivering two prisoners and... The constable told me about that. I'll wait, Sergeant, but... How soon will it be before you return here from Selkirk? I should be back within a week. <laughs> That's not long. Not after the journey I've made to get here. Then I'll see you on my return. I'll do everything possible to assist you, Miss McAllister. If I can't do it personally, I'll find men who will. Men that even your father would trust. So, uh, now if you'll pardon me, I'll get started. A few hours after Sergeant Preston had left for Fort Selkirk with his prisoners, Clay Barnum and Joe Carter sat at a corner table in a cafe talking. They had heard the greatest part of the conversation between Preston and Marion McAllister, and a plan had formed in their minds. The details were complete now, and the men prepared to act. Marion McAllister was greatly surprised next day when a clean-shaven and prepossessing young man came to her hotel room and introduced himself as a deputy from Sergeant Preston. My partner and I are always on special duty, never in uniform. 
That's why the sergeant told us to help you. I know he told you women are... Carter, recalling the pertinent parts of the conversation he'd overheard between the girl and Preston, gave a great degree of authority to what he said. He outlined the supposed plans of Preston and added... And because it's not in strict accordance with the written law, we'll have to sneak out of town after it's dark. With me dressed in men's clothes, you said? Oh, that's right, miss. You couldn't very well wear any other kind in the weather we'll run into. I still don't understand. Sergeant Preston was so positive when he told me yesterday that I'd not be allowed to go on the search. Why, he said the law... The law bows before a beautiful woman, Miss McAllister. And don't forget yesterday's not today. Sergeant Preston didn't realize that my partner and I would be in Dawson so soon. You'll uh, be ready this evening, then? Uh, Yes, about 11. I'll have my clothes bought by then. Oh, but Mr. Carter... Oh, yes? I'm going to fulfill my father's last wishes. I'll keep the map. And only I shall give the instructions where to go, up to a point. Oh, we understand, miss. That's all right with us. That night, when the only sounds in Dawson City were heard in the rowdy cafes, Marianne McAllister, bundled in men's clothes, topped by a parker, started out on the trail that headed north. Mush! Mush now! Mush! The trio had been on the trail four days. The two crooks bided their time, showing great solicitude for the young woman at all times and protecting her whenever possible from the onslaughts of snow and wind. They led her to the spot where her father had been found dead, though never telling her it was they who had found him. Marion was heartened by their knowledge of the country. It's almost as if you were reading the map I have. If I judge rightly, we'll turn off somewhere a few miles north of here. Probably towards Rocky Creek. Why, that's right. You knew that? Well, your father did a lot of prospecting around there, miss. We'd see him off. Uh, this man of his. Do you mind telling us where it is exactly? We must be near there now. It'll help us get you there if we know. I don't know where it is exactly. Didn't Sergeant Preston tell you that Daddy's map was blurred and not too detailed? Uh, yes, but, uh, well, we thought... It... Oh, that I was holding out on him because of what Daddy said? I wasn't, I assure you. Yeah, sure. Well, we we better get going. All right. Mush! 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 That night, as Marion McAllister lay inside her canvas tent, wrapped in blankets in her parka, the sound of whispers awakened her from her sleep. There was a tone about them that seemed to set off an alarm in her brain. She bent forward with her ear to the tent flap and listened. Joe Carter and Clay Barnum were ready to search Marianne McAllister's sled. I tell you, the mine has to be somewhere around here. I heard what Preston said when he was reading the map that day. All right. I don't believe that stuff she told us about not knowing where the exact spot is. That's why I want to look through her things. That's a waste of time, I tell you. She has the map on her somewhere. And I'm not going to give it to you. What? Well, now, you... You heard us talking? I did. You're not very smart, you two. And you're not very smart either, Miss McAllister. If you were, you wouldn't have busted out of your tent like you did. Come here. Keep away from me. Come near me and I'll... None of that, Shirley. What do you got there? Uh, no. Well, a gun, huh? Give it back to me. Give it to oh, me. I'll give it to you. Shut up. Oh. Barnum grabbed the girl around the waist with his right arm and placed his left hand over her mouth. She's a real wildcat, isn't Joe? Get a rope and a sled. Right. We'll have to tie our hands and ankles. Come on, hold still. Easy now, miss. No one's going to hear you. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. And now, here's someone who needs no introduction. That famous teller of tall tales, your old friend, Gabby Hayes. Uh, my name might as well have been King Neptune the time I was trying to ford a river deep in the Yukon wilderness years ago. I had my six months' supplies loaded on the stubbornest donkey the world has ever knowed. I started to lead that critter across the river. First thing I knowed, he reared up, and that donkey junked me like a donut. Not only that, but... He stood on the bank laughing at me. Well, sir, I was madder than a wet hen. I could see this was going to be a contest of sheer muscles. So before I'd done another thing, I had a great big bowl of nourish and hot Quaker roast. Jiminy, 
I could feel the strength from Quaker Oats making my muscles bigger and bigger. Why, I thought they'd bust right out of my shirt sleeves. Because, you know, oatmeal gives you more strength and more energy than any other whole grain cereal. Because Quaker Oats is the giant of the cereal. Yes, sir Bob. So then I got behind that stubborn donkey. I pushed him into the river with a mighty heave. He was going so fast, he must have thought he was a seahorse. And shucks, we made the rest of the trip by water. So listen, buckaroos, if you want the giant of the cereals to help you like it does old Gabby, start tomorrow morning to pack away creamy, delicious Quaker oats. Mmm, it sure tastes good. And wait till you see what good it does for you. Remember, everything I say about Quaker oats goes for mother's oats, too, because they're exactly the same. Now to continue. Sergeant Preston arrived back from Fort Selkirk that evening, two days ahead of schedule. When he inquired for Marion McAllister at her hotel, the clerk gave him surprising information. She checked out, Sergeant, four days ago. Oh? Going back to the States, eh? No, I'm sure she hasn't. She bought herself some men's clothes, trail stuff, and, and took off with Joe Carter and Clay Barham. I saw him leave. Joe Carter was here? What'd he do? What'd he tell her? I have no idea. All I know is what I told you. Just four nights ago, she checked out and went north. I couldn't f- figure how she expected it. Hey, Sergeant! I can't wait, Pete. Thanks for the information. Less than an hour later, Sergeant Preston, with his huskies and sled ready, prepared to leave headquarters. <laughs> King stood beside him as he spoke to Constable Harris. There's only one place they'd head, and that's up toward Rocky Creek, where her father's mine must be located. I don't understand it. Why would she leave with them if you told her to remain here? That's what I intend to find out. Going to keep on the trail while I catch up with them. King, up front, boy. <laughs> All right, on King! On, you hussy! <laughs> Jim McAllister's map was as puzzling to Clay Barnum and Joe Carter as it had been to Marion McAllister and her mother. They'd found it in the pocket of the girl's parka. For three days, they trudged the banks of Rocky Creek, keeping a very close watch on the girl at all times and trying to find some trace of the diggings. Then, on the afternoon of the third day, the plotters found a rock ledge with stakes set tight in the frozen ground beneath it. Written upon the stakes was the information that this was the property of Jim McAllister. Joe, this is it. Uh, Look at that pane of gold over there. We're going to be rich, Joe, rich. Yeah, millionaires, Clay, both of us. Let's get back to camp and make up a claim for this place. Let's find a spot where we can get rid of that Marion. You coming? Back in their camp, far off the beaten trail, Barnum and Carter gathered their mining tools together, ready to gather gold samples for a say back in town. Hey, listen. Then a bleak and frightened look covered their faces as they heard the barking of huskies coming near to where their tents stood. Joe, listen, huskies. Quick, grab the girl. We gotta get her away from here. Carter and Barnum entered the tent, bound and gagged Marion McAllister, and carried her to a place behind one of the loaded sleds. <coughs> uh, he'll find her, whoever he is. It's Preston. What? I can make him out now. Come on, back in front of the tent. Preston? That means we'll have to kill him. He's the only one that knows about this. I'll have your gun ready, but play straight when he gets here. I'm ready, too. <laughs> Sergeant Preston wasted no time as his sled came to a halt, and he walked to where Carter and Barnum waited. The two of you, eh? Carter? Marion McAllister left Dawson City with you four nights ago. Where is she? Marion McAllister? Oh, who's she? None of that, Carter. You saw her at the hotel and... Yes, King, what is it? King, whose nose had been high in the air, sniffing, was struck by the pleasant aroma somewhere in the vicinity. It was the perfume of the girl who'd become his friend at headquarters a few days before. The scent was faint, but suddenly strong enough to follow. He leaped joyfully through the snow and headed for the sled that screened Marion McAllister. Thunder King, she's there. I'm coming, boy. No, you're not. Just standing right where you are, Preston. She's alive, if that's what you want to know. Now stand there. Move an inch and we'll shoot. We'll shoot anyway. Oh, will you? Hey! 
Oh, yeah. Sergeant Preston turned and grabbed Carter's gun arm before the surprised crook could shoot. He spun oh. Carter in front of him, shielding himself from Barnum's gun. At the same time, bending the gun arm of Carter. Hey, shoot him, Clay! Shoot him! Well, get out of the way. You're blocking him. Oh. Hey, look out the dog! Oh. Hold him, King. King's leap sent Barnum off balance. Now the dog's teeth sunk into the would-be killer's arm. Ah. And Barnum, crying out in pain, dropped his gun. My arm, let go, but I... That's it, King. I'll concentrate on you, Carter. Hey. Get around here. Uh, uh, That's it. No. Uh, uh, Throw a gun, will you? Uh, uh, All right, King. I'll take over now. Thanks, boy. Uh, my, my arm pressed the goat. I'll handcuff you uh, while I'm untying Miss McAllister. There. Uh, take it you. All right, King. Got him, boy. Preston went to the spot where the crooks had placed the girl. Quickly, he loosened the ropes that bound her and helped her to her feet. How do you feel, Miss McAllister? Oh, cold. Terribly cold, but... I was too afraid to realize it until now. Sergeant, they, they were going to kill me. But they didn't. They'll never kill or threaten anyone again. Sergeant, I've got so much to tell you. Do that later, please. Right now, suppose you go into the tent and warm yourself. All right. Meanwhile, I'll get these men ready for the trip back to Dawson. Preston tied the two crooks hand and foot and placed them on his sled. Then he retraced their footsteps through the snow to the spot where they'd found the mine and noted its position for filing by the dead man's daughter. Then he returned to the tent. King, wagging his tail, waited for the girl, now surprisingly recovered from her ordeal. Sergeant, you found it, didn't you? The mine, I mean? Yes, Miss McAllister, and I'm glad I found you. You'll be able to file your claim now, arrange for having it worked, and get back to your mother in the States. What? Is, is that the only reason you're glad you found me? I'm afraid it will have to be, Miss McAllister. This is one time I wish it could be otherwise, but the... Code of the Northwest Mounted Police says we must accomplish our mission and report for a new assignment. Oh. We finish by getting our man. <laughs> In this instance, two of them, and uh, when I get them back to Dawson and into a cell, this case will be closed. Sergeant Preston will return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. This is your friend Angel Mama suggesting for breakfast, for lunch, or for supper, serve Angel Mama pancakes. Yes, folks, only Angel Mama pancake mix gives you Old South goodness and the lightest pancakes ever. For a wonderful supper tonight, just add milk to Angel Mama pancake or buckwheat mix and bake golden fluffy pancakes. For breakfast, for lunch, or for supper, serve Aunt Jemima pancakes. Be careful. Help stop accidents. Remember, fellas and girls, you, yes, you yourselves, can help stop accidents. Most accidents are due to just plain carelessness. Use your old bean when you're playing out of doors. Don't dash out into the street after a ball. Be careful when you cross streets. And don't be a smart aleck on your bike or ride in the dark without lights. Don't take chances, not even a little chance. Be extra careful. And now, here is Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston reporting for duty, Inspector. There's been a shooting, Sergeant. Get over to the Palace Hotel as soon as you can. Any details, sir? It's Luke Devlin who's been shot, and we suspect that his own gang has turned against him. You'll be dealing with the worst roughnecks in the territory, and I must warn you to watch your step. Are the inspector's suspicions correct? Has the ruthless Devlin gang turned on his leader and taken the law into its own hands? If this is the case, then the sergeant is faced with one of the most difficult assignments. Don't miss the next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon is brought to you every Sunday at this same time by Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals. So long. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Mutual.